Shop Talks, everybody. Good morning. It's a production of Impressions and In Kitchen. I'm from the In Kitchen, which is a uh, free source of uh, information online, inkitchen.com. Impressions Magazine and the show put this on with the sponsors you see on the side here. And uh, have some great screen making gurus here. Um, <laughs> uh, got Bill from Saudi. Art from Caroline and Jerry from Kiwo Yulano. And uh, we're going to talk about screens, how to make good screens, what they see out there that people are doing wrong. Um, I think the motivation for me starting this is I'm on a lot of screen printing Facebook groups, which are a great source of misinformation. Yes. I see stuff that people recommend all the time that's wrong. And so I've got some experts here. Uh, my hope is that. Not only you might take away something or see it later, these will all be recorded and online on YouTube, but also that you'll see them, you can go up to them after this right away or go to their booth and they're great sources of information as you will see. So maybe for me to you, what's one thing you see when you go out there um, that a lot of people do wrong? I, I, the thing I see, number one thing that people are doing wrong is they're not coating their screens properly. They're using a direct emulsion, and uh, they got all this hocus pocus about how they coat this way and then sideways. And you know, the, basically, the thing you need to know about coating screens is with direct emulsion is you know you always start on the substrate side and always finish coating the squeegee side. I'll walk into shops, and I'm sure you guys do too. They're like, I, I have pinholes. I need another emulsion. I, everybody's emulsions are good, okay? Uh, it's probably not the emulsion. It's they're either not degreasing properly or they're not coating properly. They coat too fast. They don't coat the proper number of coating strokes. Everybody thinks uh, the higher the mesh count, the less you have to coat because you don't need as much emulsion on a higher mesh count, and which is pretty much the opposite of the way things are. A low mesh count has a much more open mesh. And if you think about the hydraulics of the situation, when you coat the squeegee side of a screen, you're actually putting emulsion onto the substrate side. You're pouring it through the mesh and to the other side. And low mesh counts have a wide open mesh area, so the emulsion flows better through them. So you could do, get away with a one and one or a one and two. Whereas you go to a 305 with a very tiny holes, you generally have to coat two or three times on the squeegee side to get the proper EOM or emulsion over mesh. Okay, I'm gonna get back to that in a minute. All right, what, else, what are you seeing out there wrong? I'm sure you might see a few things wrong in your travels. You just might yeah. have. <laughs> There's a couple. Um, really two basic things that are interrelated. Um, to me, the biggest issue relates to exposure. And that could be you're just not using the right light source. You're not determining properly how much dosage of the right wavelength, the UV, you should be applying to the screen. And the proper way is to go on Facebook and ask how long to do and, exposures, and right? Yeah, rather than do the due diligence and actually get a Stouffer scale and go through the motion, just ask, how long do I run this? Um, that's, that's really not going to work very well. And one of the other keys to getting the proper exposure is the drying process after coating. One of the biggest problems besides using the wrong light source and applying the wrong dosage is, is the screen ready to accept the UV? And that relates to how you dry. And you know, my nightmare is we just stick them on the floor after we coat, there's a fan over here, and the same room has the washout sink and the reclaim sink and all these water sources that increase the humidity in the room and the fan just blowing humid air on the screens. And internally, they're really not that dry. I mean, I guess so. if you dried them outside on a rainy day, it would be worse, but nothing else, right? <laughs> exactly, yeah. All right, Jerry, what do you see out there? 
you might have seen well, a couple of bad things going on. What do you see? Com what are common things you see? Well, again, I mean, you know, what Art and Bill, that we're, we all touch on the same things. It, and I always tell people, it's, you know, good housekeeping in the screen room. You know, the first thing you always want to remember is it's called screen printing. It's not press printing. It's not dryer print. Everybody focuses on, you know, my press and this and that. If you don't have a good screen, you're not going to put out a good product, and you're going to have problems. But the whole process, it's, you know, like, you know how do you properly coat a screen? How do you, you know, how, what's the process of, you know, are you drying the screens properly? Is your, your humidity low enough that the, when the screens dry, they'll be able to cure properly? Uh, people will always go and say, uh, my screens, uh, you know, I go to reclaim and they're tough to reclaim. Your emulsion isn't good for that. I'm saying, no, it's not that. What was your process of getting there? And that's one thing I think all of us always try and do is teach people a proper process. And, you know, I think one of the hardest things we always hear from people is, well, I've been doing it this way for years, or this is how I was taught. And in the nicest way we can, we're saying, well, maybe you were taught incorrectly or whatever it might be, that's why we're there. We're there to aid and teach people the proper way of doing it. And, you know, exposure. Uh, probably that's the number one thing that we Agreed. tell people is you probably have to increase your exposure time uh, because people will say, well, I cut my exposure back to hold this detail. No, a properly made screen with good artwork, you should maximize your exposure time and still hold all that fine detail. You should be, you should be able to rinse your screens out and, and develop them with a pressure washer from about 12 inches away. And your screen should be, your stencil should be strong enough to withhold that. And if it isn't, then it's probably underexposed or the improper wetting agent was used with the mesh or degreaser as a lot of people call them. Um, Underexposure causes a lot more problems than you realize, including with reclaim. You get locked up screens, it's because you're underexposed, you used screen opener, which is a hot solvent, and it just locks up the emulsion. Do you think I would be overstating it to say that 30 to 50% of people are underexposing their screens? When I've been in shops, that's what way, I've found. Way too low a number. Right. So um, let, let's stay on this for a minute. Um, you mentioned uh, exposure test. You want to just briefly say what that is? Or just what's, a, what's the exposure test? So, And by the way, I, I see people uh, saying that they can't any of you would supply the people with what they need we, to do we that. give them away all the time right so anyway yeah what is so the one of the things to recognize completely here is um you know when you after you print you cure your ink properly whatever's required temperature time down the belt the whole deal right because you've got to cure it correctly actually we're to gonna get to that later today most people okay. don't do that either. so that being said you have to cure the emulsion as well and exposure is a selective cure. We've got a masking of some type that is opaque, hopefully, and we cure where we don't want to print and we don't cure where we do want to print. And in essence, we are tying the imaging process of the stencil on the screen to the cure process. That sometimes is conflicting. So what happens then in that case is 99% of the time, uh, maybe I'm a little high on that, what tends to happen is imaging wins out over curing. I've got to hold this detail. So then I determine my exposure so I can relate to detail, but I may not have thoroughly cured the stencil as much as I need to do. And then as Bill related, once we have the screen and we go to press, you know, Plastisol ink, it, we might get in more trouble if we put Miracle Whip salad dressing on the screen compared to, it will not 
reveal any marginal process in your screen making. Something aggressive like water-based ink with co-solvents will, that'll, that'll attack pretty quick. But you'll, you won't have that problem with plastisol. So all those other solvents, press wash, screen wash, screen opener, all these things you have, if the screen's not completely hardened, they can get in, they have effect on the emulsion, and then what tends to happen is when you go to reclaim later, they've caused some kind of lock-in. And then you sit and you look, and then you call one of these two guys and say, you know, your emulsion sucks because it doesn't reclaim well. That's not the issue here at all. So you have to then go through the process, do the due diligence of being able to determine what is the proper dosage on my lamp to cure the emulsion I have properly. And, and one of the ways you do that is you have an exposure calculator, you have a Stouffer scale. Uh, I would strongly recommend using what's known as a Stouffer scale. There's 21 steps, there's 10 steps. You put that on, you develop it, and higher number sections will generally, if, you, if everything was correct about the time and the dosage delivery of UV you applied, all of those sections below seven should wash out, seven and higher should remain, and you're right in the neighborhood you need to be. Um, I don't know if you want to add anything yeah, to that. A hard seven is, is what we go for. And if, if you're using a, uh, an eye image or, or a wax jet or something, we go for a six, because you're not shooting through film. But just to touch on, on the underexposure portion, a lot of people I find are underexposing because they're using inkjet film and it's not opaque enough. If you can hold the film up to light, put your finger behind a black area and see the shadow of your finger, you're not opaque enough. It's just a poor man's way of looking at how, how good is my stencil. Now, I understand people underexposed to whole detail. If you're using a pure photopolymer, meaning you're not mixing diazo into the emulsion, they will post-expose. And I recommend post-exposure for all pure photopolymer emulsions. In other words, even sit it out in the sun. The sun's a great exposure tool. Okay, it's got a lot of 405 nanometer wavelength light, which is what emulsions like to see, most of them. If you're mixing diazo in, a dual cure or a straight diazo, um, you're not going to post-expose. Because once the, that diazo sees water, it's, it's done. All right, I'm going to break that down a little more simply for uh, rookies here. So, so basically, if you got an emulsion that mixes, after you shoot it, that's all you get. If you have one that's straight out of the bucket that you coat your screens with, after you shoot it, you can put it in the sun or just leave it out, and it will get harder. So that's a good tip. Maybe speaking of tips, what are some inexpensive things that could be done that would improve a lot of uh, screen rooms that you go into? Well, I, I, you know, again, that's been said. I tell everybody, get an exposure calculator. Uh, the Stouffer wedge is a great tool. Once you've dialed in your exposure time, you put that down in the corner of the screen, you wash it out, you can see where, you know, are you holding that hard seven, and you know that you're doing well. But you've got to use an exposure calculator. What does that cost, an exposure calculator? Uh, I don't know. They can be anywhere from about 40 to $70 or something like that. And it's a small investment that every screen room should have. Um, Seeing that your average place somewhere between 15 and 20 bucks for a screen probably to when all is said and done, it's a pretty low investment, huh? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, you know, uh, every, everything else that you invest in to do the job it's a small thing, and again, it's the screen is the critical part uh, to get the job done. And if you don't have a good screen, it's going to bog you down somewhere. It's going to break down on press. It's going to be hard to reclaim, and all those things to fix that problem along the process is costing you money in labor that you're not thinking about. You're just like, just get it done, just get it done. Well, let's fix it ahead of time. You know, I always tell people. Um, you put a burger on a grill, and you're going to cook it on one side and then serve it to somebody. Are they going to want to eat that burger? No. Well, that's what happens with a screen if you don't burn it, expose it properly. Think about it. There's the thickness of your stencil. 
and this part didn't get cured with the UV light. Now it's not going to hold up on press. It's not going to reclaim well because like Bill said earlier with the different solvents that you use to clean the inks and things like that, they cross-link and harden it and lock it in so it doesn't want to come off the screen properly. So, Yeah, and, and I think another inexpensive tool that can save hours of time is a good, most people call them degreasers, we call them mesh prep, because a good mesh prep not only degreases the screen, and don't use Dawn dishwashing liquid. I mean, degreasing is only one part of mesh prep. It takes grease away. But if you think about mesh, it's polyester, it's plastic. You think about emulsion, I have a 40% solids emulsion, guess what? 60% is water. Water doesn't stick to plastic. You have to pre-treat the mesh to get the water to want to adhere to the mesh. And people say, I don't want to spend $30 for a, a, a mesh prep. Well, you, you use a drop about the size of a quarter on every screen, fractions of a cent. And if it, if it eliminates one pinhole a week, it paid for itself. Because what happens when you get a pinhole? You, you got 12 shirts if you have an automatic press that you now have to use, you know, spot, spot cleaner on. You've got to stop the press, three people not work, and tape up the screen. It's, it, it pays for itself in a, a, a hundred times over. It's, it's just penny wise and dollar foolish not to use a Very uh, much mesh so. prep. Um, just just uh, to get an idea, uh, about your exposure unit, your exposure equipment, how many people have an LED system? How many people have a metal halide lamp? How many people have UV fluorescent tubes? And let me ask a question about that. Um, how often do you change the tubes? Okay. LED systems are just different. The LEDs work or they don't. So whatever they output, they output. That's, that's the amount of light and the, and the intensity of the light. As long as they work, that's what they do. If I have a bulb system, a mercury bulb, a metal halide bulb, fluorescent tubes, etc., more I use them, the dimmer they become over time. So if you're using a system like that and you are using a timer, basically exposing in the number of seconds or minutes and seconds, over time, you're not really applying the same dosage. So think about your oven as a fixed temperature, but you have the same turkey and he weighs 14 pounds and you put him in the oven, but progressively, every weekend you do this, the oven temperature gets lower and lower and lower over time. You can't adjust it, it is what it is. Then progressively over time you are undercooking the turkey because the same three hours no longer gives the same cook because it's no longer delivering the same heat energy. So your lamps are gonna degrade. So generally I think the uh, rule of thumb is maybe a thousand hours on bulbs give or take, um, and certainly one year. Well, I've never heard so many food poisoning analogies. It's about <laughs> to make me sick, but <laughs> so let's talk about... Um, what is the ink kitchen? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there you go. So um, uh, how do you dry screens? I see people, uh, you know, I get, I've really been lucky, actually, I would say, to be in a lot of shops. Um, I see a lot of things wrong about uh, people think they're drying the screens and they're not. When it, you want to talk about what you see, what works and what doesn't work, and what are some simple things to maybe improve matters? Well, again, you know, um, drying a screen, again, if it's not dried when you go to coat it, that's when you can also you can see all these, like, fish eyes because, you know, the water is repelling different things and stuff like that. But one thing that happens all the time, I say, oh, well, are your screens dry? Well, yeah, I got the screen. I checked it, it feels nice and dry. All right, your hand has oils on it. 
you just put those oils all over that screen that you just cleaned, and now that's going to be a problem when you coat your emulsion. It's going to disperse away from there. So, you know, don't touch it. You can see, you'll see that your screen is dry. If you can create any kind of an enclosed cabinet with a small, like a filtered fan and some heat in there, and that's just going to move the heat around and speed up your drying time versus having screens, you reclaim, degrease them, put them against the wall, and you're blowing a big fan against them. Well, you're, you're printing T-shirts. There's lint everywhere. Yeah. And all you're doing is throwing that lint onto that clean screen, and those will become pinholes later on. Actually, exactly. I'm going st to step in on this one. So, like you said, you can make a cabinet. I mean, you really can make your own. I've seen a lot of inventive ways to do it. Everything, you know, involving a electrical conduit, you know, to hold them nice to, to uh, plastic bags to cover a side of a, a, a unit. But the one thing I see is a lot of times people forget air can't air just exchange. air can't just go in. It has to go out. Cool. I, I went in one place, they had an enormous fan in, in their screen uh, room. It was dark and their screens weren't dry and they went and because when the door was open this like blast of air came out. As soon as you shut the door, there was no no air flow. And then I was actually at a really big shop with like eight automatics and they had a screen thing and a fan blowing in and nothing, you could only get out around the doors. You have to have in and out, right? It, ha it has to exchange air because what you're essentially doing is, uh, think about relative humidity. Uh, the, the air, as the heat goes up in a linear fashion, its ability to hold moisture goes up in an exponential manner, okay? Which is why in the summer when it's 90% humidity, you feel like you're sitting in a sponge. Whereas in the winter, it could be 100% humidity snowing out and it feels pretty comfortable because there's not as much air, moisture in the air. Now, if you dry your screens without a drying cabinet and it's 80% relative humidity because it's raining today, then your screens are still going to hold 80% moisture. They're not dry. I mean, they're not dripping wet, but they're not dry. And even if you had dried them and put them in that, it'll yeah. reabsorb it, right? Yeah, exactly. And, and to, just to revisit that, that exchange, air exchange, you want to put heated air into the cabinet so that that hot air can, can absorb all the moisture out of the screen and then exit the cabinet to take it away. So the air is a sponge that absorbs the water and then leaves. And that's a good drying cabinet. It has not just heat, but ventilation. And there is a limit to the heat, right? What's the temperature you don't really want to go above? Uh, More I, or less. I would Rule recommend not exceeding 110 degrees exactly. Fahrenheit, yep. um, which is fine. Part of the reason being if you have a heating element of some sort, there is a controller that you're setting that says 110 or whatever you choose. That's got a tolerance on it, so it's going to drift up a little bit, drift down a little bit. So if you set it you know, 105, 110 Fahrenheit, even if it drifts up, you're still going to be in the safe zone. Uh, if you do use a diazo, maybe you only set it to 100. Um, that will keep from spoiling the, the uh, diazo. Uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about drying sequence because, as my good pal Richard Grease always says, I can hold a tomato in my hand all day. My hand doesn't get wet, but we know internally it's, it's really wet. So the key is... How do I know when it's dry? And that's probably one of the hardest things in the screen printing element is knowing when the screen is truly dry. So I did, I did a study and I looked on things and as these gentlemen will tell you, uh, often uh, emulsion can be categorized under say paint for shipping purposes and things like that. It's very similar to latex paint. You got 40 to 50% solids. I mean, it's not much different. So that being said, one of the places you can get a hint about drying is to look at studies that were done by paint companies. And I found one that basically said, on a wallboard, roller coating to 170 microns thickness, well, that just works out to be about the same as a 110 mesh with a 1-2 a or a 2-2 coating. You're in the same neighborhood. What kind of drying is required? Well, if it's on a wall board, of course, it can only evaporate out one side. 
uh, on a screen, it will go out both sides, so you have that luxury. And what they had suggested is to be truly dry at, say, 75 degrees, 70 degrees uh, Fahrenheit ambient room temperature at 40% humidity, you're looking at four hours. So if I can put it in a dryer at 90 degrees, I can probably cut that down to an hour, an hour and 20 minutes to be safely dry. That's a good rule of thumb, though, anyway. That's, that's, I like that. Um, and then what humidity, and if you have a separate room, <laughs> which you might, what's the ideal humidity range in that room that you're gonna keep your screens? We, we like to see it between 30 and 35%. Okay, what's the most you wanna see in there and what's kind of the least? 30 and 35%. A, it, all right. <laughs> That's tough for pe a lot of people though. It, it is. Where, where can you get like, maybe not optimal results, but like, acceptable results how about that you've got to be under 50 percent humidity all right and then it also can be too dry is that correct yeah right and that would be what under 25 30. i've never seen a room that that's that's that low but yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and that can be accomplished with you know dehumidifier or air conditioning right yeah. yes and then i always like to say one of the cheapest things you do is just get a gauge for the wall at least have some idea because a person cannot tell how humid it is within that range, right? If you're in a room, you can't tell if it's 50 or 20, right? Not, not really. really. You won't feel it. Right. No. So you can't feel it. It's, it's got to be measured. Um, any and, last? And can I throw in, if you have a, you've set up a confined heated space or dehumidified space, I'm going to coat and dry. I'm going to dry in here. That's terrific. Okay. You're going to speed up your drying process if you do that. The key to that, though, is if you coat, you know, some people have different methodologies, right? I coat a screen, it goes in. I coat a screen, it goes in. Some folks will coat 12 screens if that's what the area holds for the drying process. They'll coat all 12 and put them in together so that it's only one time I have to worry about. Like, when did I put the first screen in? Oh, I can I take that one out yet? Because I know I put... So they put them all in at the same time. Well, when you do that, the drying process is the evaporation of the moisture into the, into the area. So when you first put them in, the temperature and humidity are going to change from when the empty dryer was turned on and stabilized. So you've got to consider adding some of that to the drying time to make sure that the dryer isn't just blowing around moist air still, as Bill pointed out earlier, and you're not really drying yet. All right, Pam. Pam, how much time we got? All right. So, any uh, any quick questions here? Earlier, you mentioned EOM, kind of a big thing for a lot of us little guys. Just discuss the EOM and how to determine that. All right, the, so the question is, uh, what's EOM and how do you determine e it for a little guy? EOM is emulsion over mesh. It's basically how much emulsion is, how thick is your stencil is what it is. We feel I, a good rule of thumb is to get your EOM between 10 and 20%. We try and shoot for 15% with most mesh counts. Higher mesh counts, you can go a little lower. but. EOM also relates to RZ, which is stencil roughness. The higher your EOM, generally the less rough your stencil. It's not something we really worry about in the textile industry because we're printing on sponges anyway. So we don't have to worry about how smooth our stencil is. But yeah, EOM is, is important in that when you think about screen printing, you're not squishing ink onto a shirt. What you're ideally doing is flooding the screen and putting it in that stencil, and then the squeegee just allows the ink to adhere to the T-shirt and the screen lifts away. So you're setting ink on top of your garment, and EOM is very important for that. All right. Uh, ironically, this is one of the drier topics. <laughs> we could go, but we could go on forever about it. Um, all of them are here at the show. Uh, all can come back. There's a happy hour today at four o'clock. They'll, they'll all come by. Yeah. yeah. 
Thought I could get them to come by. Also, Kevin Kouth, who was originally going to be here, will be here at 4. So you catch them around the show. Catch them right after, right now. Uh, you can ask any questions you want. And um, how about a hand for these, these uh, guys? All right, I want to thank the sponsors again. Alpha Broder, Los Angeles Apparel, Hirsch, Lane 7, Omniprint, and NASDAR, and Impressions, and the Ink Kitchen. And uh, we got a full free uh, lineup of talks all day here. Check them out. I'd like to thank Rick for putting this together, too. Thanks, Thanks. very much.